Well, welcome back, everyone. Thank you so many of you for being so on time. I'm very impressed. <laughs> so, as promised, we're going to do a, bit, a quick Q&A session with our speakers from this morning. I hope you had time over lunch to gestate a few challenging questions for them. Um, I just need to make one warning that this session is being filmed and live-streamed. Um, I don't, is anyone uncomfortable with that? They'll only see the back of your heads, but just so you're aware. Okay. Um, Simon will be chairing this session, and anyone who wants to ask a question, wave at me, and I'll run up with this mic, and you can speak it into the mic. That would be great. Thanks very much. Thank you, Annie. Um, just very briefly, um, we've heard a lot about, uh, from the speakers this morning, about the secrecy, the lack of transparency, the duplicity, uh, the treachery of large institutions ranging through to central government. And I know that many of you will ask, well, uh, yes, that's a, a kind of meta, uh, a meta problem that we all face. Um, we would argue that it goes to the core of governance of the human race, and it's got to be dealt with. But you will ask the question quite reasonably at an internet conference, how does this directly influence me, my business, my consultancy, my, my media um, beat. And, and I would like to see if we can bring this back down to, to, to the subject of this conference, which is the new form of communication that brings the planet together or can split the planet apart. And given the, this amazing and very disturbing background that we've heard so far today, and believe me, it just gets worse uh, in, the, in the rest of the afternoon. Uh, it would be great if, if, if you can also think, well, okay, how does this affect communications, the internet, the direct subject of this conference? So keep that in mind. Um, it would be good to be able to, the takeaways from today should include and will include how we directly, positively address many of the things that you've heard today. But uh, let's, let's uh, just, just have a think about this because we, we do want to try and focus very much on, on the, 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 you know, so many issues, but, but solutions. Um, does anybody, well, I'll throw over to Annie at this point because you can see people, I've got light in my eyes here. So uh, do we have any thoughts, questions? I forget my duties. <laughs> what do you think about the responsibilities of, for example, Facebook that allows terrorists and other naughty people on their um, social media? Okay. Any thoughts on the responsibility of social media and the big data institutions? Very good question, um, and at the moment it's been something that, yes, sorry, can you hear me? Um, good question, because it comes down to issues in terms of, at the moment, what individual nations and governments have decided to do. Um, so you find that um, certain regulators, and for example in Germany they've been, they've regulated Facebook far more tightly than in some other countries, um, then in some instances they have been quite harsh. Um, sometimes not necessarily for reasons of necessarily combating terrorism. I mean, there are certain small federal states within uh, Germany where you can't actually use the like button anymore because it was felt to contravene local laws.
So it's my very great pleasure to introduce our first speaker this afternoon, a man many of you will probably already know of, if not know personally, Rick Falkvinger, um, the founder of the Pirate Party, the first one, of course, in Sweden, um, and also a tireless campaigner trying to protect our rights from the predations of the corporate copyright um, warriors and also from the general security hawks that are trying to invade our freedom every day on the internet. Uh, general badass as well. So welcome, Rick. Thank you, Annie. So, good afternoon, Stockholm. Are you here to hardwire freedom today? Yes. I'm sorry, Annie, this audience is broken. Do we have a support contract? <laughs> What's that? Uh, what's that? Did I try turning it off and back on again? No, yeah, no, I didn't. Good afternoon, Stockholm. Are we here to hardwire freedom? Yes. yes, we are. Goddamn right we are. I have a sign on my front door, a sign that I see when I leave my home every day. That sign says, if you follow the rules, you will always lose. If you follow the rules, you will always lose. And the deeper understanding there is that the rules were not written by you. The rules were written by another person with the implicit intention of keeping that person in the position of writing the rules and you not in the position of writing the rules. As long as you follow the rules, your best case scenario is number two. If you follow the rules, you will always lose. This, the theme here is hardwiring freedom. So how do we win our freedom? Who do we petition to get our freedom? Who do we challenge to get our freedom from them? Fuck that. That's the completely wrong mindset. You're born with freedom. You have an innate freedom. You're born with liberty. Over time, as we age, we somehow get it into our heads that we need to give up this liberty. We need to give up this freedom. We need to obey the law, the rules, the regulations. If you're asking for your liberty, you don't have it. If you're asking somebody's permission to be free, you are not free. If you want to be free, if you want liberty, you only need to start exercising the liberty you were born with and ask not a single person permission about it. Liberties are like muscles. Liberties are like muscles. They need to be exercised regularly and in full, or they will wither, atrophy, and die. I used to work in the European Parliament for a couple of years. I see the people writing the laws and regulations. you realize that a career politician's first priority is to get elected. Their second priority is to get re-elected. And whatever's third is so far behind it never ever matters in daily practice. This means that they get a certain mindset of how they behave in this democracy factory, in this lawmaking machine. I used to say that to reporters that, yes, of course I have ethics. I have a very strong sense of ethics. I'm a politician. If it's good for my career, it's ethical. And at that point, people tend to laugh, except politicians. Like, hmm. And I, then I fill up with, and the better it is for my career, the, the more ethical it is. 
At that point, people still laugh, and the career politicians start shifting really uncomfortable in their seats. And look at me. And there's something funny here, because in the European Parliament, you see scenes like a champagne tasting to remind the members of European Parliament that there are homeless people in Brussels. And obviously, you can't inv invite actual homeless people to the champagne tasting in the European Parliament. So instead, they commissioned an artist to, to cast life-size statues, statues of homeless people that the MEPs could step over while sipping champagne. And nobody actually seemed to realize how bloody repulsive this is. These are the people you look to for ethics in legislation. So if they don't have ethics, do they have skill sets? Is there at least knowledge and understanding of the IT scenario in the, in the laws that are coming out of this law factory? I'm not exaggerating when I'm saying that you're looking to people who get their secret who gets their emails printed for them by their secretaries to come up with sensible regulation for the internet. You cannot look to the law for ethics. You cannot look to somebody else for liberty. It was always yours. There's something he'll call, call the power of narrative. Who gets to determine what is true and what is false? And all of this has happened before, and all of this will happen again, which is a quote from Battlestar Galactica, a, scene, a, a series I like very much, but that doesn't make it any less true. We heard before that there have been 57 terror attacks on the UK soil, blah, blah, blah. That's chocolate rations from 1984. It could be 57, it could be 57,000. They could claim whatever they wanted. It doesn't matter. It's just a made-up number, like any other number. We know this number to be false. We know it to be an art of fabrication. We know that for certain, and I'll come back to how. But this displays the genuine ethics of the career politicians, who get away with running these numbers because it gets them re-elected, and that's their only priority. That's key to understanding here, the individual incentives. The power of narrative is one of these. Another is the power of taxation, the power of the ledger, the power of telling society who owns what from an authoritative perspe perspective. If I can tell society that, no, you don't own that house, this person owned that house, then I have an enormous power. Because that means I can also say that, no, you don't own that house. I own that house. Which is exactly how taxation took place and took form in the 7th century. It started with village courts in the UK. Let's skip the Roman times now and go back to them a little later. Village courts in the UK in the 7th century settled disputes. And as soon as the villagers of the time had agreed to hand over a little liberty to the judges who came from the crown, as soon as they had agreed to hand over the power of arbitration, they had also agreed to hand over the power for them to agree that the king actually had this money and not them. If you're looking at laws from the 7th century in the UK, the taxes came from a small percentage of judicial settlements. Yes, you owe this person 90 euros, and an additional 10 euros goes to taxes. When you hand over the power of ledger, the power of arbitration, to somebody else, they get a lot of power. Which is why Bitcoin is so interesting right now. All of a sudden, you have a public ledger that is not controlled by the government, that is not controlled by the courts, and which is, does not lend itself to control, no matter how much force the government applies to it. Bit the Bitcoin ledger 
How many here own Bitcoin? Scattered hands. Okay. So imagine that everybody's bank account was public. You didn't know who, what ba who had what bank account, but that everybody's balance, uh, there were tons of bank accounts and their balances were public. And this was a public agreement made in a way that everybody knew that it was false, knew to know that this to be true. Now, this means that it's a shared agreement rather than somebody you can point a gun at. It's like a language. You cannot point a gun at somebody and demand they change the meaning of a word. In the same sense, you cannot point a gun at somebody and demand they change a Bitcoin balance because it's designed to not be possible. It's designed to not be possible. And this is where bureaucrats go completely confused and say, but then we must have more regulation to address this. And the tech guys say, you don't understand. You might as well try to regulate gravity. It is designed to be technically impossible for you to order this balance changed. And then the bureaucrats kind of go blank and you can see their gla eyes glaze over and they're blinking for a couple of minutes and then go, but then we need more regulation to address this. <sighs> and th they're not, they cannot fathom a situation where they're losing this power of narrative, the power to dictate to society what is true and what is false, who owns what property. And this has happened before. In 1435, a guy named Gutenberg in invented the printing press. It was actually a combination of four different inventions, oil-based oil ink, movable type, the actual press, and cheap paper. That was supposed to create more Bibles, but, and it did, but not in the way Gutenberg intended. In 1517, a, nine, a guy named Martin Luther objected to the Catholic Church's abuse of the power of narrative, or its power of narrative, because the Bible was in Latin, right? And this is important. The Bible was in Latin. This means that only the clergy had the ability to read from the Bible and tell people what was in it. The clergy had the power of narrative. They had the power of interpretation. Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the church wall in 1517, and on the surface, he objected to this abuse of power where the church was selling salvation, which had no support whatsoever in the Bible. And a few years after that, he started printing his own Bibles in German and in French. And the entire continent was immediately plunged into 200 years of civil war because the book was printed in a new language. On the surface, this was about Protestants versus Catholicism, but if you look deeper at it, it was a loss of a gatekeeper position over society's knowledge and culture. Loss of a gatekeeper position over collective knowledge and culture. Does this scenario sound familiar? All of this is happening all over again. Going back to Bitcoin and Roman taxation, you can see all kinds of bureaucrats wanting to tax Bitcoin and tax Bitcoin transactions. And people say, I'm sorry, but that's just not possible. Yes, it is. We write these laws and... Okay, how are you going to enforce that? That's an implementation detail. We're going to write these laws. Okay. Just before the Roman Empire fell, in the 4th century, the Roman Empire, who had only had a poll tax up until then and land tax, created a transaction tax. Any monetary transaction carried a tax to be paid to the emperor, which was obviously impossibly silly to enforce. So they also created this law that no transactions may take place at all without a tax collector present. This was in the fourth century, and the Roman Empire fell shortly thereafter. And that the two events are not entirely unrelated. 
So going back to this power of narrative. Who tells what is true and what is false? Who is using excuses to cut down on our liberty? Who is inventing chocolate rations from 1984 or the number of terror attacks? And how can you tell they're false? How do we know that there haven't been 97 foil UK terror attacks? How do we know that the Swedish SEPO is lying their asses off when they're claiming that they foiled three terror attacks in Sweden? Do you know? Do we have an idea? We can know that with 100% certainty. They are more full of shit than a latrine at a cholera clinic. And the reason we know this is that preparing a terror attack is a very serious crime. In Sweden, the, the point is called Almen Fali Ödeläggelse. Something like de devastation with hazard to public life and health. It carries a sentence of 18 years to life. Preparing for such an attack carries the same sentence. How many convictions for this crime have we had in Sweden? Right, a big fat zero. And if we've had zero convictions for preparing a devastation in public with health to life and health, then exactly zero terror attacks have been foiled. Either they foiled something else, or they're just pulling a number out of their ass to justify whatever new powers they want. And they need to be called out on this. They need to be called out on public live television and say, Sir, you're fucking lying. Only then, when you ex start to exact personal accountability, when you're ruining people's careers over lying, will they realize that lying is not ethical. Because, because things that are bad for their career is not ethical. They knew that. And only things that are bad for their career is not ethical. We heard about the TPP and TP TTIP earlier today, the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership and the Transatlantic uh, Agreement of Inbred Bullshit. Same thing there. The corporate people are holding the negotiators accountable every single day for their, are adhering to their wishes. If you're a friend of liberty, you need to hold these very negoti negotiators personally accountable for what they do to our liberty. I, want, I seriously want to see picketing outside of their homes. I want to see our liberties exercised, our freedom of speech exercised, our freedom of protest exercised against the people who want to take that liberty away. Thank you. I want to create a situation that when somebody is asked to negotiate the next corporate deal, their reaction is something like, No! And they're seeing their career go up in flames as they're having received this punishment rather than this reward. That's how you change the world. You create individual incentives to do the right thing. Because the world is not run by an opaque system. The world is run by individual people who show up. And we can also show up. They have no genetic advantage of us over us whatsoever. So, Hardwiring freedom. I can't give you anything tangible to do because all of us have different skill sets. All of us have different experiences. All of us have different walks of life in different contexts. But what I do want everybody to take out of this room today is the mindset 
of if you're asking permission, you have selected to give up your liberty voluntarily. If you follow the rules, you will always lose. Do not ask permission. On, merely act on the liberty you were born with without asking anybody's permission at all. And help others to act on the liberty they were born with without asking anybody's permission at all. Build things that enable people to act on the liberty they were born with. Ayn Rand, I don't agree with a lot of one, what Ayn Rand wrote, but she has a few very good quotes on power. And the one thing that ties into this that I want people to take with them out of this room today is the quote, the question is not who's going to let me. The question is, who's going to stop me? We only need to act on the liberty we were born with. And that's how we hardwire freedom into ourselves. And the things we do next week, the next year, and next decade. And that's how you start changing the world, by individual things that each of us can do. Some people say that the world cannot be changed by people who feel passion and an idea. I disagree with that. It's the only thing that ever changed the world. We have an obligation to hardwire freedom into ourselves. And that's the, world, that's the words that end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for that, Rick. I loved the uh, weaving of history into the present. Um, and also a reminder that all our rights are so hard won. Our ancestors fought and bled and died to win them for us. And we need to ensure that we do not throw them away carelessly and heedlessly in this rush to protect ourselves against the terrorist threat or whatever. I also like the, the um, point about liberty. It's inherent. And I think in terms of an internet conference, um, I think that is particularly pertinent because at the moment, perhaps the new high priests, the new Catholic priests who have a direct channel between knowledge and we the people are indeed the technologists, the people who can code, who can understand. And then, of course, following on from that, the uh, control from co some of the major corporations of that access to knowledge. So I think the idea of free software, liberty, Libra software is a way that we can all push back and try and preserve our access to that knowledge rather than handing it off to the high priests of the corporations. So thank you very much for that timely reminder. And let's hope, with the Battlestar Galactica quote, it happened before and it'll all happen again, let's make sure it doesn't. We do not want to slide back into feudalism. So thank you. Next, we have an amazing line. And please forgive me for reading this because the roster of everything you do, I, there's no way I could remember this off the top of my head. It's amazing. Next, we have Jürgen Johansson, who's been working in 100 plus countries for the last 40 years on democracy, nonviolent campaign, conflicts, and related topics. Jürgen has also published 12 books and hundreds of articles. And he is the deputy editor of the Journal of Resistance Studies, international advisor to the Public Defender of Georgia, affiliated with the Programme for the Advancement of Research on Conflict and Collaboration, a faculty member at Hacettepe University, I'm not sure if I said that right, of Peace Studies in Turkey, and a board member for Das Institut for Freidensarbeit und Gewaltfreie Konflikt Austragung. <laughs> I think we're there. Thank, Thank you very much, Jürgen. Thank you, Annie. Um, the short presentation is, I'm a Norwegian by birth, but not by conviction. I may come back to that. 20 minutes, and my starting point is that terrorism is not dangerous, but profitable. It's money into this issue. And that's the main driving force for those who make big profit from it. Those who today, after Paris, are arguing for more of the same medicine that hasn't been working for the last 20 years. 
But I would like to start in another end. Scandinavia are always high up on the indexes of democracies. On the state level, there are pretty decent democracies in Scandinavia compared to other states. How did it happen? Well, first I want you to go through a little experiment with me. Because when you think you know what's going on in the world, I want to have that one. Okay. Well, I come back. Um, what you know about the world is from the media, isn't it? When you heard about Paris, it was on BBC or CNN or your local newspaper or your, your radio station. Do you trust media? No, you will say no, most of you, because you know they are lying to you now and then. But it's one of the few sources you really have. And most of the information you know about the world, since you can't go everywhere, is through media. Maybe, maybe you know some people in some parts of the world, you could ask them. So, a little experiment before we move on, a psychological experiment with you. I'm going to tell you two stories through photos. So just reflect and be silent when you see these photos. In both cases, we are watching some horrible events in two different cities, almost at the same time. High, tall buildings are attacked in both cases. You see some photos on the left and some on the right side. And there are shocking headlines in all media on these two events. The buildings are put on fire and thousands are killed. In the days to come, in these two cities, you see horrible scenes and you know that the, stank of this, the, the black smoke is not only burning buildings, but burning human corpses. It's a horrible smell if you went to any of these two cities just after they happened. And that was laying there for weeks afterwards. And a lot of other damage around these two buildings as well. Other buildings were destroyed. And you had these brave rescue workers, fire brigade men and policemen, going into the buildings. Some of them couldn't go out again. They died in there. And they were, for good reason, celebrated as heroes in both these cities. And a lot of other type of damage going around. When you lose someone close to you, a friend, a mother, a colleague, you feel extremely sorrow. It's incomparable to anything else. They didn't come back that day. You never see them in one piece again. And you see, you all know something about her story to the right. But very few in this room know the story about the man to the left. There may be one person I know who knows that story, but could anyone else tell me what the other story was about? You are clever people, you are bright, you are educated, you follow the news. Why don't you remember the illegal warfare of NATO against Serbia in 1999? The TV tower in Belgrade was the big building that put on fire. There is no anniversary, not after one year, not after five years, not after ten years, no extra movies, no extra books coming out. The media is completely silent about it. The only city that I'm lecturing when people know about that story is in Belgrade itself. Then the majority will know that story. We have no no memory. It doesn't exist in our heads. So when we are the perpetrators, the media keep silent. And that is my main problem. I could accept that that media is lying, because you could, you could go around that lies. But when, when they don't inform you, it doesn't exist. You don't know what was going on. That's a horrible situation. And you are all victims of this massive propaganda machine that has brainwashed you. How does it feel? 
Think about that before going to bed tonight. Scandinavia again. When it comes to democracy, more is scoring a pretty high. When it comes to freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of religion, better than most of the countries. And one main factor for this development is centuries of struggle against unjust and stupid laws. Sweden wasn't born like this, or Norway or Denmark. It's a struggle from below for these rights and freedoms. And they've been done very peacefully. There are extremely few cases of people struggling for more freedom with guns, with Kalashnikovs in Scandinavia. It's what you call civil disobedience in modern language. But these struggles started long before that term was established by Thoreau. A few examples. State churches had monopoly on religious services and meetings. The other churches came to Sweden and they said, we'd rather follow God than the king. And hundreds, thousands of them were put in prison because they violated that law that gave the state church monopoly. They were criminals, but, it, but they did it in public. Newspapers, the freedom of speech. This is a famous story from Aftonblad that's still, uh, still around. That was banned by the king. But then the guy who was running it had already established the new Aftonbladet. That was banned. Then the even newer Aftonbladet came out next week. He had seven newspapers already registered so he could continue publishing his newspaper, despite that the state and the king said, no, you can't do that. You're criticizing us, we don't like that. And there are many other cases of publishers, authors, writers in prison because they violated unjust and stupid laws of their time. And the laws have improved quite a lot. Or trade unions, the first one to start a civil society in Sweden of serious scale. They were seen as, as rebels and radicals and terrorists and they had to have meetings in the forest in the late 1800s. They were taken to prison. Almost every leader of the, of the trade unions in Sweden has spent time in prison because they violate the stupid laws, unjust laws. They use civil disobedience to create the freedom of association. And maybe the most important one, universal voting rights. 120 years ago, you could, you could say from the university halls that women are too stupid to run the country. Don't let them vote. They're too small brains. That was established facts. If you go back in the dictionaries and the encyclopedias from the late 1800s, early 1900s in Sweden. But some women said, fuck you. I don't care if you say I'm not wise or clever enough. And they took to the streets, they violated the laws, got imprisoned, and in the end they got the universal voting right. I could continue, but I think you got my point now. Over time, the results were many imprisoned in the struggle for more just societies. The discussions that followed functioned as a massive popular adult education project. People started discussing these topics, the freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of association, universal voting rights. It was an ongoing public discussion long before Facebook and Twitter. Okay? Everyone participated. Based on these cases in the court where people violated the laws. Movements of support built up over time on most of these issues, and the parliaments were forced to accept new legislation. That's how we developed them, step by step. Conflict with present laws, unjust laws are violated peacefully in public, and the movement of support builds and forced the parliament new legislation. That's an ongoing process, still going on. Different issues today, animal rights or whatever, but that's how we have developed a pretty good standard for democracy in this part of the world. So what about privacy? Surveillance is not a new phenomenon. It's going back old, but post 9-11 it really escalated. We all know that. A number of new things and it, the technical possibilities exploded. When someone is attacking us, our politicians want to be seen as strong and to do something. 
the last 10 days or the two weeks after Paris, you see that in every single country, I need to do something. I need to prove that I'm a strong politician. So far, the toolbox has been extremely limited, namely more of the same. Hasn't functioned earlier, but now they promise us to do more of it. Should we trust them? Up to you. If we see this as an infection in our society, post 9-11, most groups using political violent means against innocent civilians came from the Christian culture. No doubt about that. And the war on terror has created more fundamentalists than ever. Countries bombed by Western states have escalated from mainly Al-Qaeda in 2001, the Boko Haram, Al-Nusra Front, Al-Shabaab, ISIS, Ansar al-Sharia, Hamas in Iraq, Hezbollah Islam, and hundred more. These groups, these networks, are a consequence on the war of terror. And that is the war they promise to escalate now. And they do escalate. And so Russia has bombed Syria with 8,000 bombs and missiles the last couple of months. Let's calculate carefully and say, well, maybe one civilian died in every bomb. It's probably much more. One civilian per bomb, that's 8,000 killed. They have 20 relatives, each of them, who get angry and upset and want to have revenge. This is completely out of control. But no Western politician seems able to stop attacking Muslim-dominated countries that do not support the Western consensus. They don't attack Saudi Arabia, who are beheading more people than ISIS, but they are our friends. And they don't put it on YouTube. For every cruise missile bomb and grenade that kills civilians, the result is more young people willing to sacrifice their lives in attacks against us. Even the smartest bombs kill more civilians than enemies. The last figure I saw was 80 to 85 percent of the so-called smart bombs. The victims are our civilians. The media focus on our victims when they are attacked. You've seen that since the Paris event. These, of course, they are poor victims, but it's an extreme focus on them. But when we are the attackers, the perpetrators, our motivation is lifted up in the media. We have, good, we have a good motivation. We want to fight for democracy and freedom and whatever. That's all they focus on when we are bombing Libya, bombing Afghanistan, bombing Iraq, bombing Syria, for good purposes. They don't care about the victims when we are the perpetrators, only when we are the victims. It is not only bad journalism, it's counterproductive, it's dangerous because people have a tendency to believe what they see on national TV. They have a tendency to believe the newspapers, and they act accordingly. Back to privacy again. In addition to more bombs, post-Paris, we hear demands for more surveillance. The Swedish Prime Minister was out a few days ago, promised us more surveillance. The extreme level of surveillance already in function did not help to prevent the Paris event. I think Bill will talk more about that in a few minutes. And there are no independent studies proving that more surveillance prevents violent attacks. The only one who promise you that are politicians or part of the security mafia, the, in the security industry. Okay? They are the ones who promise you more of the same will do good things. The advocates of more surveillance have, of course, the burden of proof. And that is not delivered. There is no independent, unbiased studies proving that this is functioning. And during shock and mourning, it's not the right time to make important decisions. After 9-11, when Bush went to the Security Council and had these stupid 
resolutions passed quickly, or the Patriot Act, it's the wrong time to come up with this long-term legislation. You, we should wait and reflect until the smoke has left our cities. The voices who argue for more control and surveillance all benefit from such a development. Think tanks get bigger budgets when they are focusing on terrorism. The security industry, more profit. And we're talking serious money here. And the politicians get more votes. So all those voices you hear, the noise around us today about more surveillance, more control, less privacy, that's from those who benefit from this development, personally. No independent evidence it will help at all. But some on the contrary. There are some studies that tell us that more surveillance reduces the level of ordinary legal political activities. It is more than ever important to stand up for democracy, vice reflections and decency. What we need is safety, not security. Security is what you could buy on the market. The security mafia makes big profit on our fear, supported by the media. Safety is what we want and need. Safety is about building good relations, about trust, about respect, decency and privacy. If you don't want to repeat the mistakes similar to Germany in the 1930s, we need to disobey laws promoting more surveillance. Encourage more people to blow the whistle. I have uh, brought some copies of the book, Whistleblowing the Practical Guide, for you to buy later. And, and a code red is working on a pamphlet for ideas for change, a handbook for activists. Do more serious research on the negative impact of reduced privacy and expanded surveillance. Create more customer-friendly encryption systems is necessary. Do not act out of despair after bloody attacks. Reflect, don't focus only on the symptoms. And thanks for listening and let us start acting, less talking. Thank you. Wonderful stuff. Thank you so much for that. I absolutely concur with pretty much every point coming out of that presentation, so it's good to see it all seamlessly pulled together. And um, yes, beware the narrative that is imposed on us by the mainstream media. Um, you know, the fact that uh, rightly there is this outpouring of grief for the victims of the Paris attacks. Yes, that's awful. But, you know, think of the hundreds of thousands um, who have been murdered across the Middle East to support the security mafia and the geopolitical interests of America. So finding ways to work out what the problems are and begin to push back societally and democratically is very important. Um, and this is hopefully is what we're going to segue into towards the end of this afternoon.